Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 486 of the podcast and it is Friday 24th of April 2020 as I record this on day 32 of lockdown here in the UK. So today I have an interview on writing and working together as a creative couple with Jeff Adams and Will Knaus from the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. As I always say, one of the best podcast titles in the business. (laughs) So I hung out with the guys at Podcast Movement in Orlando last year and they're just really great people and it's always fascinating to learn how couples manage to work together. (laughs) It is a challenge. Plus we talk about resilience in the romance community, moving forward in difficult times, podcasting, audiobooks and more. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, obviously most physical bookstores are closed in a lot of places in the world, uh, but the bookseller is reporting that ebook and audio sales are proving a welcome ray of sunshine for publishers. People are reading comfort reads, inspirational titles, the book equivalent of a warming mug of hot chocolate. <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Uh, a, a particular interest in fiction set in warmer climes, uh, reading the closest that people can get to going abroad. And that reminds me, last night I actually dreamt of an airport. <laughs> which, And I, I don't normally like airports, but clearly I'm missing them. Um, uh, what else? Self-improvement titles and uplifting autobiographies. So if you write any of those things, now's a good time. <laughs> also, good news about digital library borrowing. draft to digital has been doing a promotion uh, for the last month or so on um, cost per checkout model, trying to get more libraries to join. And over 150 new libraries have opted into the cost per checkout model. And uh, sales via CPC cost per checkout have roughly doubled since February. Due to the huge success of this promotion, Overdrive is continuing it until the end of May. So that's good. And in fact, the BBC here in the UK reports that libraries across England have reported a surge in online borrowing since the lockdown. Loans of online ebooks, e magazines, and audiobooks were up 63% uh, compared to last year. And uh, the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals said this could turn out to be a watershed moment for libraries. Quote, not only are we attracting an entirely new audience, we're able to demonstrate that the library is every bit as accessible online as it is in person. You don't have to walk through the doors to be a library fan. So that is very cool. And of course, I've talked about this a lot, but if you are wide, if you publish wide, you can get your books into libraries uh, as ebooks, audiobooks, and of course, print books through uh, Ingram Spark. Go back and listen to that interview with Mark Leslie Lefebvre about libraries. I'm going to keep banging the drum on this. I hope you are too. Um, I think this really could be a great time, like a real opportunity for indie authors to get our books into libraries and to get people, uh, you know, borrowing in different ways and still will get paid for that. So remember, you can order your favourite author's books in libraries or ask your friends to order yours in (laughs) because having them in the catalogue is a really good idea. If you are a librarian, uh, you know, please consider bringing in some of the indie author books and uh, encouraging your library staff to use this cost per checkout model. It is really interesting. Also, (laughs) this is this uh, thing in the UK. uh, Basically, there was a mystery donor of £250,000 to a fundraising drive to help booksellers impacted by coronavirus. And everyone was like, yay, this is amazing. Some very generous somebody has um, given all this money to booksellers. They must really love books. And (laughs) turned out to be Amazon. And there's this sort of existential crisis over this money. Uh, One tweet said, there is a huge strength of feeling against Amazon among booksellers. And the horrible irony of this donation will be lost on none of us. (laughs) 
<laughs> Philip Jones, editor of the bookseller, says, extraordinary that Amazon has been revealed as the mystery donor. I remembered when they sponsored a book trust prize and authors pulled out. Shows curious state of the industry that Amazon steps up. <laughs> so it's, it's one of these moments where the booksellers really want the money, but they don't want to accept it from Amazon. So it's a classic moment. Uh, what else? Uh, the Society of Authors reports that members have been pressured to renegotiate contracts or told that royalty payments will be paid late following the crisis. Uh, agents and their author clients are receiving many requests and queries about delaying payments of all kinds, from royalties to stage payments of contractually committed payments and changes to new deals Publishers moving publication dates is another more prevalent issue, meaning delays in publication advances in most cases. The word on the street seems to be that there will be a glut of traditionally published books in autumn because they're pushing things forward because they can't get books into bookstores. So again, for indies, now's a really good time <laughs> to put books out. And now is also a really good time to be buying ads. If you have the cash flow available, then uh, ads are a lot cheaper right now because traditional publishers are not advertising because of all the cash flow issues. So um, my personal plan is to go much harder with advertising now. And then um, when September comes and all the traditional publishers put out this glut of books and they'll have to spend some money. I mean, it might not go that way, but uh, if it does, things will get very expensive in September. So um, I'm certainly doing some advertising now. Also, Barnes & Noble. Uh, we have... <laughs> seen this week, email from draft to digital emailing authors to say there's a delay in February payments. Obviously, with many of Barnes & Noble storefronts closing during the pandemic, the retailer has seen a dramatic drop in cash flow. One result of this has been a delay in paying publishers for ebooks sold via Nook. So uh, there are different reports on this, but my thought is any ebook sales through Nook will in no form, it will just be a drop in the bucket of the outgoings for a print business, print based business. So even if um, there are more Nook sales now, things are going to get difficult. If they're struggling with February's payments, then how will things go in March and April? And I, I, I would love Barnes & Noble to be completely fine. Uh, I just, I think it's going to be a struggle, difficult times ahead. And for a big report on the difficult times ahead, check out Christine Catherine Rush's uh, report this week. It's called The Train Wreck. <laughs> so that tells you a bit about it. Uh, she says, and it's definitely worth reading, obviously links in the show notes as ever. Chris says, uh, many traditional publishers will be unable to take advantage of the growth in ebooks and audiobooks and library borrows because they price so high and can't move quickly. And returns, obviously, are going to be massive, probably from books that were in store in February and March. And presumably April, May, they haven't even arrived <laughs> or the books aren't going out. But you can see uh, last week I talked a bit about that, the uh, supply chain in, in traditional publishing around print books. It's, it's so long that we're not going to really see the impacts for months ahead, basically. And Chris notes, the traditional publishing industry is falling into two or three years of complete reorganisation. The big five might not be five any longer. Viacom, CBS talked about selling Simon & Schuster before the plague hit the fan. If you remember, I mentioned that uh, a while back, a couple of months ago. There will be mergers, consolidation, sales and job losses. Uh, editors will leave, books will be orphan, orphaned or returned to the authors, hopefully if you have that in your contract. Money will get tight in traditional publishing particularly at the end of 2020 and into 2021. Traditional publishers will survive, but not all of them. And, you know, personally, I think it would be great to see a revival in more independent publishers, lots of little indie presses, just as it was before the massive conglomerates bought them all. <laughs> so, And it would be great to have lots of wonderful book people publishing books they love. Um, just, a, you know, one more step up from what we're doing as indie authors. And that really works with the indie author mindset. So, uh, I'm, you know, I know there are um, independent publishing people listening and, uh, you know, I want more of those. I really do. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, but of course, again, we're all book people. We want the print um, bookstores to stay. In fact, just today I went on to my local independent bookstore and just bought some books uh, just to support them. And, you know, I'm sure you're doing that in your community. And uh, yeah, we want books to survive. We absolutely do. 
Okay, so yeah, there are highs and lows, but parts of the industry are going to be completely fine. Others will need to find a new way of doing things. But that is true in the economy as well as in life. Companies grow and some die, just like people, (laughs) and new ones emerge. And the ones that stick around will be even stronger. So yeah, as ever. Difficult times, but opportunities for those of us who can uh, do the digital way and move fast. So in my personal update this week, I have printed the first draft of Map of the Impossible. It is on my desk. I'm very happy with that. Uh, I just love having that first print. Now, I feel like the mi- probably the middle section, 75% percent of the middle is good. I definitely need to tidy up the beginning and the end and then I need to do a whole pass over the trilogy to make sure it hangs together. It really is a true trilogy in that there is a story arc for the main one main, one of the main characters, but I have left the world open and some characters available for other stories. Uh, I'm really looking forward to finishing this trilogy because I haven't been promoting the Matt Walker books at all. Um, I mean, I've mentioned the launches and stuff, but I haven't done any ads on them because the trilogy is not completed. So I will be getting into um, sorting that out because, yeah, I'm really happy with the books. And the books were sparked uh, when I moved here to Bath. And I was, you know, I struggled moving to a smaller place after London and London satisfied a lot of my darker side, which you can read in the the London crime thriller book, starting with Desecration. And I'm very affected by place. Place is what drives my fiction, hence the Books and Travel podcast, which has a lot to do with sense of place. And uh, anyway, so when I moved to Bath, I was really struggling with being in uh, somewhere new. And there was a map shop around the corner from where the place we used to live. And I got the idea from that map shop about walking through the maps. And that theme really resonates right now because I love to be walking through a map somewhere else. But um, I love Bath and my feelings around Bath and borders. And when I started writing that first book, it was 2016, the Brexit stuff. And so a lot of feelings around borders and maps and worlds are in these books. So I'm really happy to finish the trilogy. And uh, I feel a backlog of ideas pushing against me at the moment. So I need to sort out my writing schedule and my writing process. And I will be having quite a few people coming on the show. I'm backing up some interviews at the moment since people are at home. (laughs) So uh, there will be lots on that on story and uh, writing process to come. But yeah, I want to get back to the Arcane series, book 11. I have a standalone novel. I have, oh, I just have so many things I want to write. So looking forward to getting into editing and uh, sorting this book out. Also this week, I've been recording sessions with Jay Thorne on co-writing. Um, we've co-written a couple of books together. I've co-written other books and fiction and non-fiction. So we've got a little mini course we're putting out in May. And we had this hilarious session where we read our writing diary from Risen Gods, which is from 2015. 15. And we didn't know each other so well at that point. And this diary is full of subtext and it's hilarious. We are literally just falling about laughing as we read it um, because now we can look back at that experience and read through (laughs) what we wrote to each other with a different view. So um, that will be coming up in the next couple of weeks, probably the first week of May. We'll put out that. It's only a mini course. uh, But if you're interested in co-writing, keep an ear out for that. Other useful stuff. Uh, I'm I'm pretty busy. I I feel like I'm working doubly as hard as I usually work, which is quite a lot anyway. Uh, So I've put out two things this week. 16 ways to market your audiobook. Yes, finally, Audio for Authors came out on Audible two months in their production queue um, and they've been having issues since before the corona started coronavirus uh, started but um, audio for authors now on audible 16 ways to market your audiobook I put out this week I made a video of that chapter and put all the notes from that chapter into a blog post links in the show notes um, but lots of ideas for you there and also seven steps to turn what you know into an online training course useful blog post for you um, that you can again links in the show notes or at the blog also just to let you know I have extended my 50% discount (laughs) 
<laughs> on my ebooks and selected audiobooks, including audio for authors, uh, because I, when I originally had that the discount on buying direct from my Payhip store, I thought maybe the quarantine and lockdown would be finished, but it's not. <laughs> so I'm going to extend that for another month. So you can get 50% off at payhip.com forward slash the creative pen and use discount code quarantine all caps at checkout. So quarantine if you want 50% off all of my stuff. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Ingmar says, what a great interview. As a fan of Gail, this was a special treat. I learned so much from her. I like the idea of having an author persona separated from your real self. Um, Oh, we need more steampunk and sci-fi authors. (laughs) I've had quite a lot of sci-fi and I did have more steampunk in the early days. But of course, when you've been doing this show as long as I have, things seem to move on quite quickly. (laughs) Thanks to Greg R in rural far northern California for a picture in a mask by a tractor. <laughs> he is telling up a huge pandemic victory garden. And yes, mask selfies are becoming a thing, uh, which is going to be fun. Thanks to Beth Farah for the picture walking north of Montreal, where there is still snow on the ground, whereas in Bath, it's actually hotter than the Canary Islands this week. It's beautiful. It's like summer. Angelia on, or Angelia, on YouTube says, uh, in response to what I reported on Lonely Planet, Lonely Planet? No, I love them. (laughs) Um, And also, Angelia gets excited about my Arcane box set and the London Crime Thriller box set on uh, Audible. So thank you, Angelia. I really appreciate that. Sarah says, I've, with the help of your podcast and books, I've published four books in four months uh, so far in 2020. Granted, I have a robust backlist of unpublished content, but even so, I'm proud of this achievement. That's fantastic. And that's finishing energy. If you have the work, but you haven't put it out there, then yeah, you have to go through the finishing energy of getting stuff published. And finally, John says, I've been listening to the podcast since quarantine began. It has been a great way to change my mindset and actually start writing and developing my skills. Thank you, John. And thanks to everyone uh, who tweets me at the creative pen with pictures or sends me emails joanna at the and uh, leaves comments on the show notes so today's show is sponsored by readsy the curated marketplace where you can find vetted professionals to help with your book cover design editing marketing website design and more plus free training courses on everything from writing to publishing to doing your own ads which is important i personally recommend readsy because they vet the freelancers who list on the site so that is so important there are millions of freelancers out there, but Readsy actually makes sure you're going to get quality people and you're working with someone proven. I also know Ricardo and the team and they're dedicated to the author community and have been for years. Many of you will have met or heard Ricardo at author events and know how friendly and helpful he and the team are. So if you need an editor, a cover designer or help with marketing, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y. Why the creative pen.com forward slash readsy. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, particularly now in this difficult time. And uh, it means so much to me. And I know that on the first of the month, I can download the money from Patreon. And it's it's just so important. So thank you. Thanks to those of you who've been supporting the show for years. You guys are amazing. And thanks to new patrons. Jerry Byrne, Joanne Sojinu, Angelia uh, Irizari. I wonder, I think that's the same Angelia whose comment I just read. Thank you. And Rachel Smith. So I really appreciate your support on Patreon. It demonstrates you want the show to continue. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month. And you'll get the extra monthly QA audio, which uh, April's is out now if you're a patron and if you join you'll get it as well support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get into the interview 
Jeff Adams and Will Knaus write gay romance and YA fiction. They have two podcasts, the Big Gay Fiction Podcast and the Big Gay Author Podcast, and they are also partners in life as well as business. Welcome, guys. Hi, thanks for having us here. Thanks. <laughs> so first up, tell us a bit more about how you both got into writing, starting with Jeff. I remember writing as far back as middle school. There was a literary journal that we were doing in the eighth grade. Somehow I got swept up into that. I thought the storytelling thing was really cool. And that just kept going. And even my degrees in journalism. So I even wrote as a journalist as well for like a decade or more after college. And I just always kept up with it. I, I started a small literary magazine with a college friend and that magazine he still produces to this day. And now I just, I love to write and to tell the stories. Yeah, for me, it's more a love of storytelling in general. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a lot of different stuff. Like I wanted to be a writer or an actor, or an artist. And I think it all boiled down to storytelling in general. I'm not one of those people who say, you know, I knew from the age of three, I was I was born to be a writer. I'm not one of those people. But storytelling and all of its aspects are what really draws me to uh, the profession and, and podcasting and writing in general. Isn't there some kind of acting in your history as well? Do I seem to remember? Y yes, I acted a lot in high school. I was a drama nerd and that uh, sort of played into my early 20s when both Jeff and I were doing community theater together and we met doing a production and we started going out and uh, the rest, as they say, <laughs> is history. <laughs> yeah, 25 well, I... years later, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, how many? 25. Oh my goodness, you don't look old enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank for, you for that. Yep. <laughs> uh, and for anyone just on the audio, there'll be a picture for you <laughs> to judge. But no, you two <laughs> definitely don't look that old. But no, I love that. And, uh, and when we hung out together, I remember you talking about the Amdram background, which uh, is just fantastic. So, Jeff, you started in traditional publishing with your writing and you have various hybrid projects. And uh, you've got the rights back from some of those earlier books and you've talked about rewriting them. I wanted to ask you about this because a lot of there's a lot of people coming out of traditional publishing, probably more now as we're recording this during the coronavirus uh, 2020. So what are you learning from this process of getting those books back, the rewriting? It's been, it's been really interesting and educational. As much as I've listened to your show over the years, it's clear that I didn't listen well enough in some cases. Uh, to let myself get as entrenched with a publisher as I did. Re-releasing some of the books, and we've already re-released some of the books earlier this year, was a great kind of deep dive back into self-publishing, because previously I'd only released a couple of novellas as, a, as an indie publisher. But now taking these novels... And some of them, the what's out right now, we've only done a light edit on them and put them back out. But I've also started to relook at how much I might actually be rewriting some of these things. I certainly, at least I hope, I feel like I'm a better writer now than I was, you know, eight years ago when these stories first came out. But while I was going to rewrite them originally and put them out with this publisher who I'm no longer dealing with at all. I'm now going back and going, is that my best business decision to rewrite them? Or should I just lightly edit them and put them back out? And I think for this particular trilogy, it's a mix on the answer. There's book two has never been my favorite. So I may do more in that book than the other two. But it's really like, how do I want to do this? And what makes the most sense to put them back out into the audience? Because they were well reviewed anyway. Mm. So, yeah. You mentioned being entrenched with the publisher there. Is there any sense that things are very different for you now as an indie? Like, do you, do you know what I mean? It's not just technical change of uploading books in a different way. In a lot of ways, I feel much more empowered. And I see how much, how many things I assumed were happening that maybe weren't. 
just in some of the stuff that I've re-released so far, the trajectory of money earned and what I see happening on the stores, I'm like, hmm, you know, what was happening over there before? Because I feel like I have more traction now as an indie. Now, of course, too, I worry a lot more about ROI, right? Am I Have I paid the cover off? Have I paid for whatever editing's being done? Have I paid off these elements? And are these books now, you know, they're, are they still, are they a profit center or are they still trying to become a profit center and that kind of thing? There's a lot more to think about. I think I was better set up to understand that because I'd done a little bit of indie publishing Plus, of course, knowing everything I gather from shows like yours, that it wasn't a total freak out because I watched a lot of people who left this publisher at the same time we did go, oh, my God, I don't know what to do because this is all I've ever done. Whereas we at least had a little bit of hybrid experience and even what we hadn't experienced yet, we at least understood what to look for. Mm. No, that, that's good. And we'll we'll come back to some of the business stuff in a minute. But Will, I want to come to talk about the romance community. You put out a solo show, uh, a podcast just before Christmas. It was great. And I'll link to it in the show notes about your frustration and burnout with the many difficulties going on in the romance and gay fiction writing community as well. Now, that is, it's kind of been forgotten. The RWA thing has been forgotten in the wake of coronavirus. There are a lot bigger things in the world. But if people cast their mind back, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. There are always issues in writers' organisations and the writing life. This is not a perfect community. But tell us about those feelings of hopelessness and how you moved forward, because they're actually quite relevant right now with what else is going on. Yeah, the, the frustration and burnout that I was feeling at the end of 2019 feels practically quaint uh, <laughs> in the current situation. But to t- take, let's go in the way back machine and look at the end of 2019, which I felt had just turned into an absolute garbage dump of a year. So much stuff was going on with the romance community, and I was really angry and tired and frustrated. And instead of like blowing up and doing a a ranty pants rage post online, I decided to uh, take a step back and uh, think about what is most helpful to our community and especially the community that we interact with on our podcast. So I wrote a short little missive talking about my sadness and and frustration at the current situation. Primarily what was going on in gay romance at the time is the difficulty with this particular publisher that we were dealing with. A lot of people were frankly getting screwed over in catastrophic ways. And on top of that, there was all of the awful stuff that was going on with RWA. And one day I just, I, I blew up and I told Jeff, it's like, I threw my hands up in the air and it's like, what is even the point anymore? I was so frustrated. So I wrote this post. The cornerstone of it was the Maya Angelou quote, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And I use that as a a jumping off point, talking about, yes, there are some bad people doing bad things in the community right now, but the majority of us love romance. And there's the, the reason that we join this community and we advocate it advocate for it so much, those reasons are still true. So the waters may be choppy right now, but they will they will become calm, hopefully, in the future. So that's what that post was all about. Kind of there are some bad apples in the barrel, but they're not going to spoil the whole bunch. Because I do believe in the 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 hope that romance as a genre in general, I do believe in in the hope that it gives people and what um, working with some of the amazing people that we've had the chance to talk with and work with in conjunction with our writing and with the podcast. It's just, it's really incredible. So I was angry and I kind of worked through that a little bit at the end of 2019, but now we have a whole other set of different issues that I think (laughs) all of us are trying to work through. None of us know how to do this. This is, you know, unprecedented times that we're living in. 
So I think we're all just trying to figure it out as we go. Mm. And just on that, the thing about there are some always some bad apples. I mean, the indie community in general, we've the KU scammers, we've got yeah. the so-called tsunami of crap and, you know, the people who just dump hundreds of crap books on the store and this type of thing. It's certainly not just romance that has its issues, but we, as you say, those of us who stand for quality and, you know, look after each other, that's the important uh, place to be. So just a follow-up question, Will. So how is the romance community doing now? You know, because I would think in coronavirus, I've certainly felt like, oh, let's read some happy books. And, you know, is are things looking good? Is because the community pulled together again? I think like any other genre, people are still trying to feel their way around what the current situation is going to be. Are readers reading right now? Some of them are reading more than ever. Some of them are not. I mean, I personally had to take some time off from reading fiction just because that's not where my mind has been at lately. Mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to the romance community, I think we're all trying to figure this out. Some of the podcasts that I've listened to and some of the people that I know online, I think they tend to fall into two different camps when it comes to writers. Either you have stopped writing completely because your mind is preoccupied with the worldwide pandemic right now, as it should be if you're dealing with, you know, health issues or money issues or you know keeping your family safe that should of course be at you know the forefront of your mind so there are people who have stopped writing altogether but on the opposite end of the spectrum i know that there are some authors who have like dived into writing like they never have before and they're using this opportunity to escape into fiction and what i'm finding is that there's really no middle ground no one is able to do business as usual simply because the world isn't that way. And and we're not going to know what business as usual is going to be probably for several weeks or several months. Mm, absolutely. So, Jeff, talking of business as usual, you had a book launch <laughs> a couple of weeks ago during the, I guess, the first few weeks of lockdown there in the USA. So, and it was, tell us about that because it was also working with four other authors. So, wh- t- tell us about the challenges of, of launching. <laughs> so we launched the Hockey Allies Bachelor Bid Romances. They're, Sounds good, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say, you know. <laughs> Having said this on my own shows a few times and in some marketing videos, it's like that is a hard thing to wrap your mouth around. <laughs> there it's an interlock, it's a shared universe where we all wrote books centered around the National Hockey League's All-Star Game weekend, which happens at the end of January. We brought all of our athletes together. And at some point in each of the books, these athletes are going through the bachelor auction. My book, for example, the, the auction happens in the front of the story in the first act. And then the, you know, the, the romance happens from there. Other books had it at the end. Other books had it in the middle. And, When we set up our release plan, we were releasing on April 7th, which would have been when the NHL started its Stanley Cup playoffs. So we're like, this is perfect. We're at the start of playoffs and we'll take that and that'll be our linchpin for marketing. No. (laughs) So it turned into there's no hockey on TV or being played. So you can read some hockey players finding their romance. The... You know, all things considered, at least for me, and I can't speak for the other four authors because we really haven't traded numbers yet. For me, it was a successful launch. It's one of the most successful launches I've ever had. So I'm pleased with how the first week has looked, you know, in terms of how it released. We certainly had engagement from readers in the various Facebook groups we were in doing our marketing pushes. Because a couple of the authors have very large reader groups because they write a lot of hockey romance. So by and large, I'm happy. I mean, we'll see how the book plays over its first 30 days, its first quarter, and obviously the long tail from there. But at least in this first bit, we seem to have done okay in getting our books out there and having people at least pick them up, both sales and in Kindle Unlimited. 
Mm. And so what's what's working best for you at the moment in terms of marketing with romance? Because the romance readers are, uh, writers are, are often ahead of the pack in terms of marketing. Or it sounds like if Facebook groups are, you know, still key, then that's a sort of return to, to old school almost at the moment. I think it really works in the case, especially for a couple of these authors that were, were kind of the more senior ones in our group, R.J. Scott and V.L. Losi, they have really honed their hockey romance audience into some pretty solid Facebook groups. And so being able to be in their groups and have them as part of this universe, I think, helped the, the propulsion on it more than if I would have dropped just a book of hockey romance without them or without them kind of being the forefront of our group um, in terms of established authors. So that definitely, I think, played into it that, you know, people who read those books will now go read our books because of the shared universe, the, the crossing of characters between the books and everything like that. It certainly helped, at least in my opinion, <laughs> getting the books out the door well. Yeah, no, well, that collaboration, I think, is still really important. And talking of collaboration, you guys have written, uh, co-written a romance together. Also hockey, The Hockey Player's Heart, which has a really cute cover. I'm not into hockey. It's not a thing we really do here in the UK, but I was like, that's so cute. So, Will, tell us about the experience of co-writing uh, together and any challenges well, as you know, Joanna, there are both joys and sorrows when it comes to co-writing, and we are certainly no exception. The book that you're talking about, The Hockey Player's Heart, came out a couple of years ago now. And that's one of the things that we have received the rights back and have re-released independently. So we're really happy with how that process has turned out. But when it came to co-writing, I think Jeff and I made the, in hindsight, rather stupid assumption <laughs> that simply because that we were, you know, ideal life partners and got along swimmingly, that that meant we were going to be uh, perfect co-writers as well. And when it came to the hockey player's heart, I think we managed to avoid a lot of the speed bumps and potholes that you can encounter when you are co-writing a book. Just by sheer luck, when it, uh, we wrote that book together, things seemed to work out. And I think the end product uh, has been well received. People have really liked that book. When we originally sold that book to a publisher, it was the idea that it would be a continuing series. So once Hockey Player's Heart was published, we started working on the second book. And that's when we hit a few of those bumps. We hit all of the bumps <laughs> and we quickly realized that although we're we're husbands and we love hanging out together all of the time, that we actually have two very different views on how to approach fiction and how to write fiction. And that all came to fruition with this second book. And it ended up being not publishable. The book just didn't work. So what if it the question is, is are we going to maybe co-write in the future? And that's still up in the air. I don't know. Uh, if we decided to do it again, we would have to like fundamentally reassess the, the process of doing that because, um, boy, howdy, it did not work for that book. <laughs> <laughs> so to, uh, give me a specific example of where you differed in your uh, opinions. Well, I think when it came to the writing of the book, we sat down and we came up with the characters and the plot line. So we kind of came with a, a bullet point idea of what the book was going to be about. And we gave that to Jeff. He was going to be our, our first draft guy. And when I got the book in hand, it wasn't anything like I imagined it would be. <laughs> We had very different ideas of who these people were and how their relationship was going to play out over the course of this romance. And we just couldn't, in the attempt to edit that book, we just really couldn't come to a consensus. It just, it just didn't hang together. It didn't make sense. So moving forward in the future, I think 
really detailed communication and making sure we implicitly understand what we mean when we say, you know, this is the scene where they flirt together. Is it cutesy or is it sexy? We have very different ideas about what's cutesy and what's sexy. And I think that's the problem that we mainly encountered with that book. Yeah, because like for me, when I write in general, I have my plot. I do give myself the outline, you know, this needs to happen, this scene, this scene, this scene. And then how I get from A to B in that scene isn't on that outline. It, that's the discovery writer part that kicks in. And my discovery writer went places that his did not. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if we do it again, the key will be not producing the entire first draft, but write a chapter, maybe two, and then say, is this right? Is it not? So that I'm not so far off in some other direction that it can't be fixable. Mm. Um, now, and then however yeah. else we may choose to alter from there. Cause I would like to co-write with him again. And he certainly influences all my books. Cause we'll talk about plot a lot um, and how to fix things. He's, he's the reason, one of the reasons that there's a fourth act in the current book is because he helped me figure it out along with Rachel Heron's 90 days to done class. I'll give her a plug too. Cause I was in her class writing this book and that class plus him really helped hone that book. Yeah, that is a good good tip. Rachel's been on the show, a uh, friend of the show, and of course the writer as well. Uh, Rachel and Jay Thorne's podcast is fantastic as well. We're all just podcast mates, aren't we? Really, <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so taking it out of fiction then into the business and the other tasks uh, that go into being authors and writers and creatives. So how do you manage that as a as a partnership? I think Jeff does the majority of the heavy lifting, especially when it comes to the technical side of the business, whether that's putting a book up on the various distributors or producing the various podcasts that we have. I think where we're definitely more collaborative is where it comes to idea generation and directions of where we want to go, whether that's with a plot line or with a particular episode of a podcast. I think that's where we kind of share the yeah. share the joy. <laughs> and even coming up with new ideas and tactics we may want to try in the business. And while he leaves the technical to me, I leave a lot of the business information gathering to him because he'll gather. We have a set of podcasts that we listen to together. But he listens to a lot more, reads a lot more, and he'll come in and say, I just heard this on this podcast, or I read this blog post over here, and we should think about this. And so he's taking in more information than I am, and I think that helps influence the idea creation and helps keep us on the right track, too. Because if I were trying to do this solely on my own, having a day job, writing books and trying to juggle everything else, I would definitely have stuff that falls through the cracks that he helps to make sure sur get surfaced and taken care of and at least considered. Right then, well, Will, uh, we need to know, what are, you, what are you listening to and what are you bringing into the mix? What, what should the <laughs> listeners be paying attention to? I'm interested. If there is a person who listens to too many podcasts and reads too many craft books, I think... <laughs> I would be in the in the running for yeah it's far far too many um, podcasts that we, we've already mentioned Rachel Heron's show the one that she does with Jay Thorne writer as well all of the usual suspects I think that have been around for a, a couple of years who have managed to build some authority in the area especially when it comes to marketing and, and business aspects there are some really terrific. Uh, romance writing podcasts that uh, I've been listening to uh, recently. There's a podcast that Claire Lydon does on My Lesbian Radio. The show is called The Lesbian Book Club, where she talks to authors about their specific books and their writing journeys. I really enjoy that. Claire is actually a very talented author, but she's also a really terrific 
interviewer as well. So she talks to authors on that. Claire chats with T.B. Markinson every week, and they kind of dig into the lesbian fiction side of, of romance, of the romance genre and the business and how they approach it. So those are just a few that I enjoy listening to every week. Mm. So that you're really deep into the romance and the gay romance uh, genre, right? Which I think is really cool because I think because I write all over the shop, I always and, and I end up listening to podcasts on AI, you know, one week and then I'm listening to a lot of politics at the moment and I'll listen to demonology podcasts. And <laughs> and what's so funny is I don't really feel like I have a genre home so much as you guys are so embedded. Do you feel like you you are really embedded? I would say so. And it's one of the the strengths I think that the podcasts have actually given us over the years is we know so many people. We don't just see authors at a con and say, hi, how's it going? Because we've interviewed so many over the years, we're able to, you know, go and have a craft discussion. We can, you know, ping somebody on Facebook. Can we talk for a minute? Because we've got these questions and want to talk about these things. Mm. We've got such a network around us that I don't think we would have had necessarily if it was only about writing books. We know so many people, and that's part of why we started the author podcast, too, was because the fiction show is really geared for readers. And the questions we ask there are really, you know, reader centric. You might get a little in the process a little bit because readers like that behind the scenes kind of thing. But to get more on the business side with the author show, we're able to now – everybody who comes on fiction, we ask five to seven questions after the fiction interview that are specific around business. Like what's a big success? What, what's a failure that you learn from? What's your advice for somebody that starts out? So we benefit from that information. Our audience benefits from it. And it just it, – it helps to expand our – network of people we can reach out to and who also feel like they can come to us if they need, you know, help or guidance on something. And Will, like one of the things that people wonder with podcasting is, is the amount of time it takes worth it when we could be doing something else to make money with our books? Like, you know, what what do you feel is the benefit of podcasting for authors? Well, number one, don't go into podcasting to make money. Yeah. Um, cause that's frankly not going to happen for the vast majority of us. We have a, a Patreon for our show. And since the very beginning, it has paid for some of the back end costs for producing the show. We do things on a shoestring. It, when it's, when we say that it's just the two of us, we literally mean it is literally just these two people right here <laughs> talking to you right now. We are the only ones that, you know, put our hands on this particular show. So the costs are relatively low. I think a question of why authors might want to podcast uh, or create a podcast for themselves is, is that it's a way to build a platform to have authority in a specific area, depending upon, you know, what niche your podcast covers. I think that's part of the reason why we started the Big Gay Fiction podcast five years ago. Not only is it something that we, you know, talk about on a regular basis anyway, but it also builds authority and is it a platform to, so when we encounter people in the real world or online, people can go, oh, Jeff and Will, those are the podcast guys. They know what they're talking about. Um, and that's literally what has happened at certain conventions. <laughs> it's, hey, it's the podcast guys. But so I think, you know, building authority, building a platform is something that is intangible. And it's something that has an incredibly long tail. So if you're interested in starting a podcast or exploring what a podcast can do for your business, be prepared to work on it for a long time because you're probably not going to see any sort of benefits or payoffs for many, many years. So for most people, if you're curious about it, I say give it a shot. But I think for most authors, you're probably better off creating uh, more IP and writing the next yeah. book. You've really got to have your why solid. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, for us, 
not only do we want to talk about gay fiction, but yeah, if we if you like the books we're talking about, you might like what we write too. And we certainly plug our books almost every episode as like an ad break, you know, that we're pushing out something as an author. And it's funny we're talking about this because we're actually presenting I guess we're presenting a presentation, which sounds really weird to say, <laughs> um, at a at a gay fiction writers author event this coming weekend about podcasting. And one of our big messages, if you're going to start your own, is really think about the time. You know, the fiction show probably takes five hours a week to produce the hour show between the interviews and recording our stuff and putting it all together and putting it out there and making all the promotional stuff. You know, I can write, if I'm in a good dictation flow, I can do about 12, 1200 words in an hour. So there's, you know, what is that math? Like 7,000 something words that maybe I didn't write because I'm working on the podcast. And I think as an author, you have to think about how many words are you not possibly producing while you're doing a podcast or whatever that activity is, think about how that trades off. Cause it might be harder to think as an author and a creative, it might be hard to put a dollar amount on your time, mm -hmm. but as a writer, you could certainly put probably a word count on that time. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Cause it, it's hilarious because those of us who podcast me included always say, Oh, you know, think twice about it. Cause it takes a long time. And here's us, you know, you've got two shows. I've got two shows. It's ridiculous. Oh, we clearly None of us have as many as Jay Thorne has. <laughs> no, no, Jay has uncountable numbers, <laughs> but let me ask you about audiobooks, Cause of course, uh, we hung out in podcast movement when we were allowed to travel <laughs> last year in 2019 um, in Orlando. What, was that Orlando? It was, wasn't it? Yes. Yep. Yeah, Crocs in the in the lake and everything. And one of the things, and then after that, of course, I came back and I wrote audio for authors and really thought about how podcasting sells audiobooks mm -hmm. and have really got into, you know, my nonfiction audiobooks sell because people you know, listen to the podcast. Do you find that with your fiction, do you have that in audio? Are you doing more audio? Are you narrating your stories? You know, how are you selling more fiction audio through your audio podcast? So far, we're not. <laughs> um, we had, I've got two super short audio books out there that were kind of experiments working with other narrators I do have a project that I'm working on to re-release my young adult thriller series with a narrator, but that's not, you know, gay romance either. And unfortunately, the audiobook that we had was with the publisher that we left, and that audiobook is just dead. But there is very much what you write in the book about the tie together of audio first and, you know, the podcasting for audio first and moving towards audio books for that, just for that additional reason, because there's so many reasons to go audio. We certainly see it where the more audio books you have, the better. And we're seeing some authors really collaborate with their narrators in interesting ways to start to push forward even more audio. There's a, a narrator, Kurt Graves, who has done a lot of work with an author by the name of TJ Klune. And Kurt has developed a podcast around the entire fandom that TJ has known as the Clunatics. <laughs> nice. And that yeah. has become its own podcast. And so not only does that help drive potentially more overall book sales, gives their fandom a way to go, but it's put Kurt's voice out there and Kurt is one of the primary voices in TJ's world of books that it all just feeds on itself. And that podcast has just happened. It just debuted back in March, but I'm very interested to see how that trajectory of that kind of podcast pushes the book sales and pushes the audio because mm -hmm. you're hearing one of the narrators talk about that world on a weekly basis. Yeah. And I really want us to do more creative work with 
audio, like our idea of a podcast and our idea of an audio book, these things need to be blown out and done. You know, yeah. we need to do all kinds of things. As you say, you know, we can do audio drama. Indies can do audio dramas within sure. the world. Or we can actually podcast an audio book first in series, for example. Or, you know, there's so many things we can do that we're not really yeah. doing. And perhaps that's because not many people have the skills, but partly podcasting is learning these skills, right? Exactly. So, you know, I think there's a lot more potential. I had a short story that was in my YA world that I actually, mainly because I wanted to see what it was like, I recorded the audio for it. And it wasn't like your short story collection. You didn't try to do voices. You didn't try to do a performance. I read the book. And I, that at least gave me more of an understanding on, yeah, I, I totally get why a narrator may charge $300 a finished hour. Cause that was a lot of time <laughs> for an audio file that was just a touch over an hour. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I don't have the stomach to do that my own. <laughs> <laughs> do that yourself. What about you, Will? I think in the future, like you said, exploring and blurring the lines between podcasting and audiobooks is something that we all need to at least think about and explore. I think how people interact with technology, especially voice, as we work through the worldwide pandemic, how everyone is going to consume content in the future. I think it's going to open up a lot of different possibilities and readers and people who consume other types of content are going to be coming to podcasts and audiobooks when that was something that they had never really experienced before. Uh, something we were just talking about on one of our shows is that through this uh, particular point in time, so many people for the very first time are FaceTiming and going on Zoom in order to talk with you know friends and family members, people who have never had any experience with this kind of technology before. Mm -hmm. So once we get through the current COVID-19 situation, how is that how is that use of technology going to inform how people interact with different yeah. kinds of content? I think it's, it's opening up some new possibilities and, and the new norm is going to be very, very different in the coming months. Yeah. And even storytelling may totally yeah, turn on its head because we've seen all these performers taking to Zoom and taking to Skype and taking to the different platforms to present work. There was a benefit performance of a Terrence McNally play that happened for actors on, I don't know if it was Skype or Zoom, but four actors were there and they were performing the play. It wasn't just a reading, they were acting their parts because you, you could see it in their faces and such. And they all did it from home. There was, there was a Sesame Street thing that was on the other night that was Cookie Monster and Elmo and everybody FaceTiming as, <laughs> as, to help children understand what was happening. So who knows what it could mean for performance and storytelling as everybody mm -hmm. has been forced to embrace these technologies all of a sudden. Mm, but So that's a good positive note to end on, that there will be more <laughs> ways of storytelling in this new world, um, <laughs> which is fantastic. So tell everybody where they can find you and your books and everything you guys do online. So many places to go. So my books you can find at jeffadamswrites.com. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is, as you would imagine, biggayfictionpodcast.com, and that's new episodes every Monday. And biggayauthorpodcast.com is new episodes every Saturday. Yeah, and if you're interested in uh, keeping up with what I'm doing, you can go to willkanaus.com. That's W-I-L-L-K-N-A-U-S-S.com. And as, as Jeff said, we have a new episodes of our podcast every single week. So check those out. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, guys. That was great. So I hope you found the discussion with Jeff and Will interesting and that it gave you some ideas for your own community building and book marketing. So next week, I'll be talking about writing and selling short fiction with Matty Dalrymple, why writing shorts can be effective and how to publish them, make money or use them to connect with readers. So that is coming up. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. 
Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.